Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. I pray a special blessing upon all you fathers. I say, Lord, bless the fathers and grant them wisdom to do what you have called them to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Our message this morning is entitled, Refocus on Fathers. If you search the phrase, Father's Day, this is one of the results that you will get. It's Wikipedia's written article about the celebration, and I want to quote it. Father's Day is a holiday honoring one's father, as well as fatherhood, paternal bonds, and the influence of fathers in society. If only, if only that was true, that society would honor fatherhood, would honor paternal bonds, and would honor the influence of fathers in our society. That would be overwhelmingly great. But as it is, we live in a day when the whole world has lost sight of what it means to be a father. We have taken fathers out of fatherhood, and we have taken masculinity out of males. To act like a man, a masculine man, means to have toxic masculinity. But to think that way, if you think about it, is a direct attack on men and on fatherhood. Whether you realize it or not, it is. I believe it is high time that we stop letting these George Soros and Bill Gates funded think tanks dictate what is acceptable and not acceptable as masculine or manliness and take a God perspective and refocus on fathers. I am a born biological male and just the thought of me having to say that or to describe myself like that should be shameful. It should be plain to see, but not in these days that we live in. Sad, very sad, that men are derided if they act like a man, and they are praised and honored if they act like a woman. I am a husband and a father and I count it a God-given privilege to be what I am. And you, you too, you should, every one of you should be proud of what God has created you to be. This is a trustworthy saying. God does not make mistakes. Each one was born in the body and the sex that God determined for them beforehand. So. Don't let sorrows or the deep state fool you. They don't have your best interests at heart. God does. Therefore, let us not take our cues from those who are determined to destroy and not build, or those who are determined to scatter and not gather together, or those who are focused on killing instead of healing. Instead, let us refocus on fathers and rebuild the family. And now, today's message, refocus on fathers. Please turn with me to our scripture reading found in Genesis chapter 18, verse 16 through 21. Then the man set up from there and they looked down towards Sodom and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Let me give you some background information on what's going on here. 
The Lord, along with two angels, had come down to pay Sodom and Gomorrah a visit because of the great outcry, the grievous outcry against that city that had come up to God. Now God has come down to see if indeed this outcry was as vicious and as cruel and as wicked as the outcry that had reached him. But first, the Lord made a stop on his way. He paid Abraham, his friend, a visit and he informed him, this is what he said, I will surely return to you about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Finally, the time had come for God's promise to Abraham to be fulfilled. He would finally have his promised son by his wife and not his concubine. Sarah was listening inside the tent when the Lord was telling Abraham the good news. And when she heard it, she laughed because she did not believe it, because it sounded to her impossible. How could this be? But Abraham believed. After all those years of marriage and of barrenness, Abraham and Sarah were finally going to have their own child together. Although all hope was gone, although there was no way for them to naturally or medically produce a child together, although what was being prophesied was totally and completely impossible, yet God said, I will do this thing about this same time next year. And you know what he did. Now, I want to read three verses and unpack a few truths that are hidden there. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 through 19. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? See that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. God said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? He said this because he was planning to make Abraham into a great and mighty nation. Not only that, but all the nations, every single soul would be blessed because of him because he would be the father of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. He would be the forefather. And besides that, Abraham was a prophet and God does nothing without revealing his plan to his prophets. But what thing was the Lord not willing to hide from Abraham? The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where his nephew Lot lived. God's judgment would soon fall on those wicked and rebellious cities. But at any rate, Abraham was a great, great man of great faith. He was even called the friend of God. But do you know what he was not called? A great intercessor. Do you know who were called great intercessors? Noah, Daniel, Job. These men, they were so outstanding that God mentions them by name. He said that they could only save themselves because of their righteousness. Although they were great intercessors, although they pleaded on behalf of their people, on, on behalf of their families, he said this time the wickedness is so great that they can save no one else but themselves and themselves alone. Even if all three great intercessors of the Old Testament, they could only save themselves because of their own righteousness. How great of intercessors they were. How righteous and holy these men were. Abraham, he interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he negotiated down to 10 souls from 50 down to 10. I believe that if he had asked for five righteous, 
then God would have relented and said, done. But as it is, he didn't. And that is why I believe that he is remembered for his great faith only and not for his great intercession as well. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I believe that he was a great man and it was a great thing to be called a friend of God, to be called a great man of faith. I would love to be called a friend of God. I would love to be called a great man of faith. But I would also love to be called a great intercessor. The New Testament believers all focused on intercessory prayer. Jesus himself was an intercessor and he still is an intercessor. He intercedes for us. Paul was an intercessor, Peter an intercessor, James, John, Stephen was an intercessor, Barnabas, and many, many more. They were all intercessors. The New Testament church was a church of praying and interceding men and women. Fathers, we need to intercede more for our own families. Now, in verse 19, God says that he himself had chosen Abraham. And the reason why he had chosen him? So that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Understand that the job of the father in the home is to command his children and his household in the things of God. Fathers, we don't leave it up to mothers to do. That's not their job. It's our job to command our children. It's our job to command our household in the things of God. We are to teach. We are to instruct. That is the basic function or the basic duty of a father. The word here, command, is the Hebrew word, sawa. It means order tell, instruct, give direction, decree, that is state with force or authority what others must do. And this is according to the dictionary for biblical languages with Semitic domains. Fathers, we as the head of our household, we don't suggest. It's not up for debate. Like Joshua stated in his most famous saying, as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Our duty is to instruct and give directions and then enforce our instructions in our own households. We don't negotiate. We don't make deals. We don't beg and plead. We state emphatically, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is high time we take fathers out of the closet where we have stuffed them and bring them out the shadows where we have chased them and allow them into the light so that they may do their job, our job. So front and center, fathers, we are refocusing on fathers. We're refocusing on you. Pew Research said that, and I quote, Dads place a high priority on their children becoming honest, ethical, and hardworking adults. Now, this is not to say that moms don't, but statistics state that dads make it a priority for their children. This statistics prove, or at the least, it is consistent with what I just said, which proves it is a God thing. You want to know something else? Here's what statistics say about fathers. When men become dads and are involved in their children's lives, they transform in many ways. They are happier. They have better physical and mental health. They live longer, have less depression, have increased self-esteem, and are more active in their community. They're more involved with civic groups, are moved to adopt a healthier model of masculinity, reduce alcohol and substance use, find stable 
secure jobs, better manage and save money, strengthen family ties. Who knew that God would place an outlet with such a great and huge benefit for men? And even more than that, for fathers, just for doing their God-given job of instructing and being involved with their families, and more specific, being involved with their children's lives. Maybe that is why there are other more grim statistics, like this one from Statistica.com. Since the 1950s, the suicide rate in the United States have been significantly higher among men than women. In 2019, the suicide rate among men was over 3.5 times higher than that of women. However, the rate of suicide for both men and women has increased gradually over the past couple of decades. I don't know what happened around that time. But research shows that if you will only get involved in your children's lives, if you will only be a dad, if you will only teach correct, if you will only love and protect your children, you will love longer, you will be happier, and you will be healthier. Men, fathers, the family is under attack. They are trying to make fathers obsolete. They are taking fathers out of the spotlight by taking the focus off of fathers. We need to refocus on fathers. Active fathers in the home are our only hope for saving our families. It is our God-given right. It's our God-given design and God's desire for us to have a father and a mother who are both active and a part of the home, a part of the family, involved. There was a time when the statement, wait until your father gets home, would strike fear in the heart of a child. Nowadays, that statement is a joke. First off, statistics say that 33, that's over one third percent of children live without their biological father in the home. Secondly, approximately 72% of future parents do not intend to use physical punishment as discipline with their children. That means there will be little to no consequences, kind of like real life, real society life here today. There is no real consequences for crimes committed. If there were stiffer penalties and those penalties were enforced, there would be a decrease in crime overnight. Instead, you have politicians joining in with agitators calling for defunding the police. The rich, as well as the politicians, are bailing criminals out of jail as soon as they're put in by the police. They have successfully created a world of chaos and confusion. It's a crazy, mixed up, shook up, blown up, upside down world we live in. What's, what's right is wrong, and what's wrong is right. And it's all confusing these days. And we think, oh, for simpler days, days gone by when all looked as it should. But these days are not those days that we live in. These are the days of attack on the home, attack on the fathers. Get them out of the home, they plot. Take them out of the spotlight, they plan. Toxic masculinity, they scream. But if we're going to save the family, we must refocus on the father. Fathers. We need you. As fathers, we need to know we must take our place in the home. We must also teach, train, show, and discipline our children. If you love your child, you must discipline him or her. You must teach them the right way. 
It's imperative that they learn right from wrong at home. Our society has nothing to teach them. Our society has everything mixed up and confused. Therefore, we need to ensure that our children learn graciousness, learn righteousness, and learn godliness at home because society will not teach them those things. King David, the king of Israel, had many sons, but two in particular, Amnon and Absalom. Amnon, King David's eldest son, I suppose he was his pride and joy. Amnon lusted after his half-sister Tamar, and in the end, he raped her through the bad advice of his first cousin, David's older brother's son. David was obviously upset when he heard about it, but the scriptures never once indicated that he did anything at all about it. He never corrected the wrong. He never even addressed the wrong, according to the scriptures that we read. He just ignored it and hoped that it would eventually and gradually go away. It didn't. Tamar was Absalom's full sister, and he was furious. But he never said anything good or bad to either Amnon or his father David. Absalom planned his revenge, and two years later, he got his opportunity. While he was sharing sheep, he invited all the king's sons, his brothers, including Amnon and his father David. David declined to go. He said, I'll be just be a burden. I I'm not going to go out. But he said, send Amnon then, please, Father, send him. David's like, why? Why should Amnon go? But Absalom insisted, and so David sent him. And all the king's son went down there to meet Mary. And when Amnon's heart was merry with wine, Absalom had his servants murder his brother. It all went downhill from there, ending in a civil war against his own father, David. Ultimately, Absalom lost his life in that rebellion. David lost two of his sons that he loved dearly. He wept bitterly for both sons, all because he did not or would not address the issues of discipline for wrongdoing. Proverbs 13 verse 24 says, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. We must, and I repeat, we must train up our children in the way that they should go so that when they're old, they will not depart from the way of truth. In other words, teach, correct, love, and protect your children. They are a gift from God. Therefore, let us save our families. Let us fight for our homes. Let us love our wives and let us teach and discipline our children in love and with much affection. So in closing, let me ask you, how is your relationship with your Heavenly Father? Do you know His Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior? If you don't, but you would, you would like to, here's how you do it. All you have to do is to repeat this prayer after me. Mean it with all your heart. Turn from your blatant sin and believe that Jesus forgave you. And you know what? He will. If you're ready to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, repeat this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, Lord. And help me to live for you. Lord, as a father, help me to discipline my children. Help me to teach my children. Help me to love my wife. Help me to protect my families. And Lord, I give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to say 
Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. May the Lord God bless you richly and give you the wisdom to do what it is that he called you to do. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.